Hey, good morning, online church family. We're glad you're tuning in for service this morning. My name is Ricky. We're glad you're tuning in for Park Crest service this morning, whether if you're on YouTube or Facebook. Uh, before we get started, I want you to interact in that comment section. Let us know that you're watching with us today. Maybe you're tuning in the day be- day after uh, today, or maybe you're tuning in live right now. Let us know that you're watching with us this morning in the comment section. Say hi. Let us know where you're watching from. Maybe you're in your house. Maybe you're in uh, your car. Maybe you're not. Hopefully, you're not driving while you're watching. Maybe you're in another state. Just let us know. Interact in that comment section. And we should have a host in that comment section kind of letting you know what's going on in service, what's coming up. Uh, details about service. Uh, she should be or he should be in the comment section right now interacting with you. So make sure you say hi to your comment section hosts. Uh, they're there for any questions that you might have about uh, Parkrest as a whole or any events that might be coming up in the near future. And once again, we're grateful that you are tuning in for service this morning. Maybe it's your first time tuning in to our online platforms. Uh, we want to get connected with you. If you haven't filled out that con- connection card, you can go to parkrestbaptist.org slash uh, I think it's just the website, parkersbaptist.org. You can fill out that connection card there. We would love to connect with you that way. And other ways that you can get connected here at Parkrest is through some of our upcoming events. And we have a few upcoming events for summer, finishing up the summer and going into the fall. Last Wednesday, we had our church-wide picnic night, and it was a great way to fellowship and to uh, meet people in the church, just have a good time together. Uh, you can go to parkersbaptist.org slash events, and you can see what events that we have coming up uh, for you here soon. But we have worship plan for you. We have a message plan for you. Pastor Phil is going to be continuing his series, In Common. We're in the week four of this series, In Common. He's going to be talking through serving today, so don't go anywhere. We have worship plan for you, uh, and you'll see, hear some details about some events that we have coming up. Uh, so interact in that comment section, share this post, uh, let people know that you're watching with us this morning and get the word out that there's church happening this morning by sharing it with your friends, sharing it to your Facebook page, sharing the YouTube link to Facebook. Uh, get the word out that there's church happening this morning here at Parkers. But we're going to get started here in just a little bit, so don't go anywhere. Grab that Bible, grab that notebook and whatever else you need for service this morning and let's get ready to worship.
Christ. We are so glad you're here. If you would please stand with us, whether you're online or here in person, we are glad that you are here. Who am I that the highest king would welcome me? I was lost, but he brought me in. Oh, his love for me. Oh, his love for me. Whom the sun sets free. Oh, it's free indeed. I'm a child. He has ransomed me, His grace runs deep. While I was a slave to sin, Jesus died for me. Yes, He died. Thank you so much for joining us this morning. Whether you are in person or online, we are glad that you are with us this morning. If this is your first time here at Parkcrest, we would love to welcome you. Now at the Information Center in our lobby, we have a gift for you. It's just a thank you for joining us for here at Parkcrest, and our Information Center host would love to meet you and welcome you. Also out in our lobby, we have our pastor meet and greet. We set aside the first few minutes after service for you to be able to meet our pastor, Phil Hasley, and his wife, Stephanie. They would love to meet you, and we would love to welcome you at Parkcrest. So if this is your first time, we would also ask you to fill out our connection card. Our connection card is a way just for us to be able to connect with you and for you to be able to connect with us here at Parkcrest, and one of our staff pastors will reach out to you this week. Speaking of ways to get connected and involved at Parkcrest, this past Wednesday, we had our church-wide park night. Who else had a great time at this event? From basketball to board games inside of an air-conditioned room, right? That was a big blessing, especially with the 100 degree temperatures we had that day. To everyone's new favorite sport, pickleball, right? We had a lot to do and we had a great time this past Wednesday. So thank you so much for joining us this past Wednesday for our church-wide park night. We had a great time being able to hang out with you. Today at Parkcrest, we are having a green team informational meeting. If you love the outdoors and love trimming, hedging, and all of those other activities, this is for you. This meeting will take place in our foundations room right over here. If you're unfamiliar with where that room is, you can exit this door right over here at the main auditorium, and it'll be the room to your right. And so this meeting will take place immediately following service if you're interested in that. We again just wanna say thank you so much for joining us today at Parkcrest. Next Sunday, 
we're going to be having Pastor Jerry Thorpe with us. Pastor Jerry Thorpe was a pastor at Crossroads Fellowship in Midland, Texas for many years, and it is always a blessing to have him here at Parkcrest, and he is a familiar face here. And we're looking forward to hearing from him next Sunday. But before next Sunday, this Saturday, we are having a men's breakfast from 8 to 10. We would love for you to join us as we're going to have food and fun and fellowship. We're going to have a lot to do, and we are looking forward to this Saturday. It'll be from 8 to 10 in our young adults room in our student building, and the cost is $5 per person. So be sure to join us this Saturday to be here for the men's breakfast, and Jerry Thorpe will be there as well, and we're looking forward to that. One last thing that I want to mention today is a new activity we have coming up called the Park Family Olympics. This is going to be for our families here at the park, and it'll be a fun time for you to have fun with your family and to also be a blessing to our families within the Springfield community. So if you would pay attention to the screens and watch this video. We know that eventually it will have to end, but that doesn't mean the fun has to end. Join us from 1.30 p.m. to 3.30 p.m. on Sunday, August 13th for all kinds of family fun and competitions as we kick off the new school year. On this day, we will meet in the gym at 1.30 p.m. to go over the rules and the schedule of activities for the afternoon. And then the competitions will commence. Games will range from athletic to artistic to intellectual, and they will be available for all ages at the park. All activities are optional for participation, but the family with the most points at the end will be crowned the winners of the 2023 Park Family Olympics. The best part of this day is that no matter who wins, the day will end with all of us packing backpacks full of school supplies for local kids in need. What a great way to set the example of serving with your family and have a little bit of fun along the way. But to have those bags ready to pack, we need your help. Starting this Sunday, signups will be available in the lobby to bring items for the backpacks. If you would like to donate for this event, write your name on what you want to contribute and then pick up a couple things the next time you run to the store. Donations can be dropped in the designated barrel in the lobby. At the park, we believe that you are never too young to live for God. So join us for this family outreach opportunity and get ready for the first annual Back to School Park Family Olympics. Can you stand as we continue to worship? to be so 
worshiping with us, if you would please be seated and turn your attention towards the screen. Thank you very much. Turn in your Bibles, if you would, to Ephesians chapter 5. We're going to con continue our series on what we have in common. Again, we started this where we talked about really the world emphasizes our differences. We talk about the things that are different about different people and different locations, different jobs, different personalities. Um, and really the world emphasizes that. Be and mainly because I think they, what they want to emphasize is their uniqueness. And I'm, I'm okay with that. And I think everybody is unique in their own way. And I'm glad of that. Um, but when we come together as a church, as a body of believers, there are certain things that I want to emphasize that we have in common and really and talk about that. So we've looked at, we've been in Ephesians chapter 2 where we talked about that we're, what, what we have in common is that we're in Christ. We have a relationship together, and that's something that we have in common. We were in Ephesians chapter 4. We talked about the, really the role that we walk in unity. It does, not uniformity, but unity. It doesn't mean that everybody has to be alike. It doesn't mean that everybody has to do exactly the same thing. But it means that we're going to walk together in the same direction together as a church. Uh, you know how confusing it would be if in your family, every member of your family had a different priority and were, they were pushing certain different directions and how confusing that would be. And so what you try to do is you, you have those family meetings every once in a while and say, hey, here's what we're talking about doing. Here's what we need to do is right. And we sort of refocus them so it's a walk in unity. Then last week we talked about the plan for maturity. There's a, there's a common path uh, to growth, to, to spiritual maturity in the life of a believer. And we talked about discipleship. We talked about grow groups. We talked about services. And then we emphasize your time in God's Word. We want you to grow in your relationship with Christ. And so we want to, we want to focus you on the Scripture. And when we come together uh, in our grow groups or in discipleship or in the services, uh, we open up the Word of God, and that is really what brings us together. Even though, again, we're so different in so many different ways, this is really that what we have in common. It's a plan for maturity for us to grow as individuals. In Ephesians 5, we're going to look at verse 15 through 21. We're going to read it together. If you don't have a Bible with you, right there in the hymnal rack in front of you is a black hardbound Bible. I'd ask that you go ahead and pick that up because we're going to read several pieces, of, uh, several verses that are together. And I don't know, everybody has a different learning style. I remember uh, there was a teacher, my I want to say is my second grade teacher, Miss Katsinas. And you're like, are you kidding me? You remember your second grade teacher? Yes, I do. Because she read, uh, the reading time during the day was reading through the line in which Nord wrote. And I remember sitting there and listening to her. And I remember picturing, uh, building this picture as she read. And so everybody has a different learning style. Um, but it's important to understand the value that we place on the Word of God. And so I want you to see what's there, not necessarily what I uh, say about it. I want you to see the scripture, okay? So Ephesians 5, verses 15 through 21, in that hymnal, uh, that Bible that's in your hymnal rack, it's page 815. And let me thank you all for being here today. Thank you for joining us online as well. You've made an effort to be here. If this is your first time at Park Crest, boy, you came into a place that you've never, you don't know people here, you've never been here before. Thank you so much for coming. This is really our focal point. It's the Word of God. And so Ephesians chapter 5 is where we're going to open up. We're going to talk about another thing that we have in common. And what we have in common is really a focus on others and serving others. Um, did you ever ask for something at Christmas that you never received? 
Do you ever ask for a certain toy? Do you ever ask for a certain item? Did you ever, uh, here, this is, uh, I always, <laughs> I always ask for cologne. It's something easy. Honestly, when they, when everybody says, hey, give me your, your Christmas wish. I don't have a Christmas wish list. I don't, I, it's difficult for me to put that together. I was jaded as a child because they gave me the Sears Roebuck catalog. I circled everything in it and I never got any of it. So I've just stopped giving my wish list to anybody. Have, were you, you ever, did you ever wish for something or ask for something that maybe you never received? Isn't it amazing when we talk about Christmas that we practice recognizing Christ's birth by receiving gifts ourselves? Isn't that amazing how we sort of turn that around? And it, it's amazing that at when we're celebrating Christ's birth, that I'm really looking forward to something I'm going to get. And I've asked for that. And um, in reality, man, the greatest gift of all was Jesus Christ. Yet at times when we ask for something and we don't get what we asked for, we feel like, well, we didn't get what we wanted. Woe is me. In reality, um, Again, what we've been blessed with is Jesus Christ. But there are times when we don't receive what we, what we wanted. And um, I think it's important to reevaluate and sort of give a really good perspective on this. That um, Christmas isn't about us. It's about Jesus Christ. Yet, it's easy to get in the habit of providing every request Stephanie is really good at it where if somebody says, hey, I'd like this, boy, she's writing it down. She gets out that list. Boy, she's got a list of, hey, we're going to go here. We're going to get this. We're going to do this and get this. Because sort of the goal is to get them what they want, to, to complete a wish. I, I don't think anybody's ever made demands, but they've made requests, very strong requests. And what we want to do because we love them is to fulfill their wish. To, to meet their request. Uh, many times, it's out of love because of a relationship. But get this. I don't know if it's you. Maybe I'm the freak of nature here. Sometimes we want to fulfill that wish or request as a goal of keeping someone happy. Isn't that crazy? We just want them to be happy. That they get something and they're, and they're satisfied. Now get this. You know that that way of thinking plays out in other areas of our life. That way of thinking plays out in other areas of our life. Restaurants cater to us. I don't want pickle. I don't want ketchup. And boy, if we get a pickle and ketchup on there, we're marching in there and trading that burger back in and we want one free or something. Restaurants cater to us. We expect businesses to serve us. Uh, the funniest part about this is that you have a card that says if you get 10 uh, cups of coffee for $5 each, your 11th one is free. And so when we're getting close to that 10th, we want to buy extra coffee, maybe two or three that day, because tomorrow we're going to get one free. Isn't it amazing how they've really taken us so that we get something that we want the ultimate goal is I give something to get something. We tend to grow accustomed to that. And then we can come into a body of believers, into a church, and expect a church to cater to our preferences and serve our needs as if the church should fall in line with the rest of the world. Sometimes we even get angry, make demands. I'd like to offer you a different perspective to life as a believer in Christ. I would like to offer you a different perspective to life as a believer in Christ. You see, serving in the church is not about what I want. What we have in common is not a mentality to give and to get. It is not the mentality to cater to my needs. But we need the mentality to serve others out of a heart of gratitude. Can I get an amen on that? 
Ephesians chapter 5, look at verse 15 with me if you would. We're going to walk down these, this, these verses, uh, Ephesians chapter 5, verses 15 through 21. Keep in mind, we, we laid the groundwork, the context of, of the book of Ephesians. They're believers, both Jews and Gentiles, that had come to saving faith in Jesus Christ. They were sitting together, and they were sitting together, and they were talking about here the things that you're, you have in common. Why? Because in that venue, in that context, there were Jews and Gentiles. They looked at things totally different. And so Paul comes along and says, hey, here are the things that you have in common emphasize the things that you have in common. That's why he said we're one in Christ. There's one faith, one Lord, one baptism. It was a passage that, that Sandy walked his way through. And he talked about how we are together. Verse 10 of chapter 2 says, For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Verse 14 of chapter 2, for he himself is our peace who has made both one and has broken down the, the middle wall of separation. So he's emphasizing this port, part where the, this is the thing that you have in common together. Even though there are differences, here are the things that are in common. So let's see what we find in Ephesians chapter 5. Look at verse 15 with me if you would. I'll read it out loud. I'd like for you to, to read it and follow along as I read. See then that you walk circumspectly. Did you use that word this week? I didn't. What it means is carefully. The idea, it, 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 the, the real deeper meaning of the word is to walk with your head up. It means to look around, to watch what you're doing. Have you ever walked with your head down? It's crazy. Some of the younger people... They're, man, they're working on their phones and stuff and can walk off the curb, walk into a pole. So it says, see then that you walk circumspectly. It means with your head up carefully, not as fools, but as wise. Redeeming the time because the days are evil. The book of Ephesians is written to a church, this body of believers. Paul knew many of them. And cared for him and was paying attention to them. And they were paying attention to him. Here, he is instructing them on how they should live. While we have a tendency to see the negatives, Paul is saying, here's what we have in common that are positive. And what I want you to do is I want you to walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise, I want, you, I want to read that same verse in the Amplified translation, it's, it, it, which expands on the meaning of each individual word. Here's what it says. Making the very most of your time on earth, recognizing and taking advantage of each opportunity and using it with wisdom and diligence because the days are filled with evil. See, then that you walk circumspectly, carefully, not as fools, but as wise. Redeeming the time because the days are evil. Look at verse 17. Therefore, do not be unwise. Okay, here there's an a, a added emphasis on wisdom. He says, I want you, not fools, but wise. I, and, and therefore, do not be unwise, but understand what the will of the Lord is. I want you to know what God wants you to do. Look at verse 18. And do not be drunk with wine. In which is dissipation. You use that word this week? Probably not. It means senseless or reckless. Which is dissipation. It's, it's, it's reckless. But be filled with the Spirit. Using the word fill, uh, he is not talking about content as in a cup and filling it all the way to the brim. What he's talking about here is control. Be filled, be controlled with the Spirit. Verse 19, speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord, giving thanks always for all things to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 21, underline this verse. Submitting to one another in the fear of God. Here's where the emphasis we find talk about serving one another. I think we all understand we, we live in a culture that's really about me, myself, and I. Here's what I want. 
here's what I think, and we could, it, I found at times in conversations, conversations go back and forth, and it's, it's funny to watch some conversations because this person's talking about a situation they've been in, and this person's waiting to talk about themselves. And then this person talks about themselves. It, you, that, that's a reflection of our culture. So here, what we find, submitting to one another in the fear of God, that is countercultural. That goes against what we're trained to do. I want to point out to you, really, Paul's emphasis. He's giving the believers in Ephesus instruction, and he's giving them guidance. Listen to these action words. I'm going to walk from 15 down to 21. I want you to hear every action word that is written. Walk circumspectly, redeeming the time. Understand what the will of the Lord is. Be filled with spirit, speaking to one another in psalms and hymns, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord, giving thanks always for all things to God the Father, submitting to one another in the fear of God. All of those phrases stand on their own and are instruction for them and their life as they walk together in their relationship with the Lord. When he uses the word walk, he's talking about living your life. Living your life out in your daily walk. Not just when you come to church. You see, what we do is we come here, we understand the truths that we hear in God's word, and then when we leave here, the goal is to live that out. And by the way, if you're here today and you say, you're you're not a church person, you're not a believer, get this. You get to sit in and listen today what is expected of people that say that they're Christians. Their walk is to be different. And you say, well, I'm not a Christian. I haven't trusted in Christ. I'm I'm just here today. I'm trying to figure out what you guys are talking about. This is something where you can hear what Christians are supposed to be like and what they're supposed to do, how they're supposed to live because he's he's talking about their walk. And then he says, redeem means to use your time wisely. Don't be unwise. Don't be foolish. Redeem the time. And then it's pretty clear. Understand what the will of the Lord is. He's saying, don't walk with your head down, not knowing what in the world's going on. I want you to know what the Lord wants you to do. Put all of those phrases together. And then Paul writes, submitting to one another in the fear of God. It's almost like Paul knows the way that we are today. No, I think the point, other than that, was that's the way they they were there as well. You know why? Because they're people. Different culture, different time, different customs. Still like us. Because they focused on themselves. It was a culture like that. Also note in these verses that Paul talks about two opposing sides in the passage, let me emphasize verse 15. See then that you walk circumspectly. That's one side, not as fools. That's the other side. But as wise, that's the other side. Okay? Verse 17, therefore do not be unwise, but understand what the will of the Lord is. He gives both sides there. Look at verse 18. And do not be drunk with wine in which is dissipation, but be filled with the Spirit. So let's break some things down. Look at verse 15 through 17. Emphasis in verse 15 is walk circumspectly, not as fools. Has anybody ever modeled that life for you? I I realized as a dad that I am displaying what I have instructed my children to do. I've instructed them to do right. When they did something wrong, there was a punishment for that. And then I wanted them to know, here's what's right to do. And when I let them know, here's what's right to do, they needed somebody to model that. And that needed to be me. Or their mom, or a teacher, or a preacher, or an adult. They needed to model that out. Have you ever had somebody that paid attention, wanted to walk wisely, strategically said, I'm not going to be, I'm not going to live foolishly. I'm not going to just, just wander through life. You ever had anybody model that life for you? Paul is trying to model that for them, but he's not there. He's writing this letter to them. 
They can't see him. So he says in verse 15 and 16, avoid foolishness. In verse 17, live wisely. Honestly, I don't think people live foolishly on purpose. I don't think somebody sets out and says, I'm just going to mess my life up today. I'm going to make the worst decisions I could possibly make because I'm out to just destroy every part of my future. I don't think people walk foolishly on purpose. But I would say that there is foolishness. Would you agree with me on that? Would you all shake your head? There's some foolishness going on. I'm telling you what, there's some delusional stuff going on. It's like, are you kidding me? That doesn't even make sense. That's just my personal, I'll get back off the soapbox there, okay? Honestly, I don't think people live foolishly. But if you ask me the question, does foolishness go on in the church? I'd have to say yes. In every church around the world, Satan uses two tactics. And I'm just going to list two of them. Deception and distraction. Deception and distraction. What's deception? It's to see something differently. It's to, to put a different face on something. To deceive. And the devil doesn't want you to walk in, in, in your relationship with the Lord. He set out to deceive you. Here's what's better. Here's how you should act. Listen, you just do whatever you want. Do however, just you live your life however you feel you should. That's a deception. You're being deceived by the devil. The second part is distraction. To get focused on something other than our mission. You ever been there? (laughs) Every time I go to my toolbox to get something, I'm working on my motorcycle and doing this stuff. And I'm telling you, my motorcycle's right there. The toolbox is right there. And from getting up right here to standing up right here, I forget what I've come over here for. Are you kidding me? I'm distracted. I'm like, hey, I didn't know my dad had that tool. That's pretty cool. I think I should go and clean it. And I've totally forgotten about working on my motorcycle over here. You know, the devil wants to distract you from being the church. From living the way that God wants you to live. And he'll do anything to deceive you. And if there's any progress being made, he'll do anything to distract you. Tom Rainer put together a list of the, the title of his article is Top Silly Things Church Members Fight Over. Uh, of that 25, I took my top 10. I'm going to give you, I'm going to work way down. Top silly things church members fight over. Number 10, a church dispute of whether or not to install stall dividers in the women's restroom. Can you believe that there was a fight over that? I can answer that question. I wouldn't even ask anybody. Put the dividers in. Number nine, an argument, a church argument that required a vote to decide if a clock in the worship center should be removed. Number eight, and they get better. A fight over which picture of Jesus to put in the foyer. Number seven, Tom Rainer is, he works for Lifeway, Southern Baptist Organization, and what he does, he works with pastors. He just put a tweet out there and said, hey, let me, give me, give me some of the craziness and stuff you've, you've, have, have gone through as a pastor. These are legit. These have happened. Number seven, a petition was passed around to have all church staff clean shaven. It's funny, I had a friend who had a goatee, and um, he the church, when the, the church that he was going to speak at found out that he had a goatee, they canceled him, said they don't want him, that they don't allow people to come and speak there that don't have facial hair. And his response was, don't you have eyebrows? <laughs> Number six, a dispute over whether the worship leader should have his shoes on during the service. Again, I could settle that one. Number five, Wow. Two different churches reported fights over the type of coffee. In one of the churches, they moved from Folgers to a stronger Starbucks brand. In the other church, they simply moved to a stronger brand. Members left the church in the latter example. Number four, an argument over whether the fake 
dusty plants should be removed from around the podium. Uh, Number three, we're getting closer to number one. A major conflict when the youth borrowed a crock pot from the kitchen that had not been used for years. Number two, an argument on whether the church should allow deviled eggs at the church meal. (laughs) And number one is better than that. A disagreement over using the term potluck instead of pot blessing. He ends this article by saying, and I think the quote will be on the screen, these issues are silly, many are absurd, but they are all distractions from what we should be doing in our church. Ultimately, they're distractions from the Great Commission. To that, I would say amen. Let me take a side note on this. While you hear about these from this list There are many disgruntled individuals that will play out their frustrations on social media. While the rest of the world is watching and they say, why would I ever want to be like that? Why would I ever want to go to church with that person? Why would I ever, the world watches and the dysfunction church members. While we're reminded of some of the silliness that many people see as important, let me ask you this. If you were the only Christian example visible to a non-Christian person, would they want to know Christ? Or would they out and out reject Him? There's some foolish patterns that work against our mission as a church members and follow as followers of Christ. We need to live wisely, which means serving others in a way that's motivated by God's priorities, not our personal wants and comfort. What do you think it looks like when a person follows the scripture that we just talked about and is filled with the Holy Spirit in their daily life as they live out? What do you think that looks like? Well, look at verse 18. Let's answer it. Look at verse 18. Do not be drunk with wine, in which is dissipation, it's reckless, but be filled with the Spirit. Okay? Now let's work, take that and let's work our way up to a greater, deeper meaning. If you want to take that at superficial value, here's what it's talking about. Don't be drunk with wine. The emphasis is yielding control to something else. Uh, the Bible says, wine's a mocker, strong drink is raging. He that's deceived thereby is not wise. What happens is, if you're drunk with wine, you're yielding yourself and control of yourself to something else. He says, don't do that. But be filled with the Spirit. Okay, so what he's saying is, you yield your control to the Holy Spirit in your life. Don't give it to something that's out of control. Give it to the one that's in control. Be filled with the Spirit. So, here, how do we set out to do that, to live wisely? How do we set out to be focused on our mission, verse 16? How do we set out to do that according to God's will? When we're, when we're by nature selfish individuals. Selfishness is something we all have in common as well, don't we? As a church family, what the ch- church is supposed to have in common is serving others. To be others minded, not ourself. It's our nature to want others to serve us rather than be the servants. So is living wisely or uh, on mission and according to God's will something that we just have to work harder at? Is it something that, okay, if that's what the scripture tells me to do, then I'm going to have to push off all this other stuff. I'm really going to have to try to remain on focus and and do what God wants me to do. And I'm just going to work as hard as I possibly can. I can hear somebody maybe in counseling say, just serve others whether you want to or not. 
No, that's not the answer. It's not to try harder. It's not to, f- to focus our lives on. It, according to Paul, the answer is not found in taking control ourselves. The answer is found in surrendering your control to the Holy Spirit who works in your life. Verse 18. Do not be drunk with wine, in which is dissipation, but be filled with the Spirit. Let the Holy Spirit control you. Let the Lord lead you. It is not in us selfishly demanding our way, but yielding to God to work in our life through the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit works in the life of every believer and produces fruit in our lives. We've all, many people that have grown up in church talked about the fruit of the Spirit. When we daily submit to God and His Spirit, He produces what? Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faith, gentleness, and what? Self-control. He produces that in our lives. That's what we live out. That's fruit that we expect out of an individual that relies on, is filled with the Holy Spirit. Now, to be filled with the Spirit is to be controlled and empowered by Him. But it's not a one-time thing. The verb filled points to continuous action. And it is to be understood as go on being filled. In other words, it's something that we're to pay attention to every day of our lives. That means if you said, hey, listen, I've done a great job today. You're going to wake up tomorrow And because you're just as human as you've always been, you're going to want selfish things. Here's what I want. Here's what I think. Here's what I deserve. It is something to pay attention to every day. Jesus told those that were following him in Luke chapter 9, verse 23, If anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. Think of the example of the early Christians. The early Christians. When you read, open up the book of Acts. Read about those that became followers of Christ. They gave their life to the Lord to follow him and to live out their faith. If you read through Acts chapter 1 through 10, what you're going to find is there's certain characteristics about those new believers. You see, they had in common that they sold their possessions to help meet the needs of others. They would sacrifice their own wants for the sake of others. They were known for their generosity. They had a passion to share their faith. That's what they had in common. Well, where do all of those come from? Did they just put their head down and say, we have to work harder at it? No. It is evidence that the Holy Spirit was working in their life to accomplish all of those things. The Holy Spirit was active. If we submit to the Holy Spirit, the same will happen in the lives of believers today. And that's what God wants of us. Don't be drunk with wine. Don't yield your control to anything else. Be filled with the Spirit. Tom Rainer is quoted as saying in his book, I Am a Church Member, which we read probably eight, nine, ten years ago. We encouraged all of our church to read that together. Here's a quote. We will never find joy in church membership when we're constantly seeking things our way. So looking at that, and normally there are times when we hear a scripture presented that we're like, man, I wish so-and-so was here to hear that. Boy, they really need to hear that. Well, again, we tend to apply those things to other people. But today, here's really the, the important part. As, you, as we get into God's Word, we evaluate our own lives. See what needs to change. So what needs to change to happen my life to be in, in order of the Scripture and to live by serving others the way that God wants me to serve? Here's the answer to that question. We have to get out of the mindset of this culture and the culture, the mindset that the culture's trained us to follow. When we evaluate our participation in any giving to, a, to, to, to or serving others, we are trained to think, 
Here's what selfishness does. What's in it for me? How do I benefit? Why should I adjust my schedule? How does it impact me and my time? Where does this leave me? Will I be better off after I do this? When will it help me in my situation? That is when we're yielding control to something else, and it's our, our personal. We want, it, we want it our way. That's the way we're trained to think. But when I submit to the Holy Spirit working in my life as a follower of Christ, get this, my perspective changes. How does it change? First, I'm thankful for what God's done in me and through me. I am thankful, understanding that I am nobody and I don't deserve what he's given me. I am thankful for what God has done in me. When I submit to the Holy Spirit, it makes me thankful that God would even think about using me, that he has offered me forgiveness for my sins. I am to be thankful. I am thankful of that, that he offers you and me a place in heaven, and he offers me freedom from my sin. When I yield to the Holy Spirit, I can't help but be thankful for all I've been given. When I yield to the culture of this world, I'm like, hey, I haven't been given enough. I deserve this, and I think I deserve this, and you better do this for me. When I submit to the Holy Spirit working in my life as a follower of Christ, number two, I am undeserving of God's grace and mercy. He has graciously given his son. John 3, 16. I want you to hear how both of these verses fit together. He has graciously given his son. John 3, 16 says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him would not perish but have everlasting life. So he graciously has given his son. Get this. He is merciful to every sinner. John 3, 17 says, For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world but that the world through him might be saved. When I yield to the Holy Spirit, good heavens, I am so thankful for all that I've been given. I am thankful for his grace and his mercy. And the third, I am in awe and wonder of of all that God has already given. You see, I get his strength. I get his power. He didn't set me out to live this life on my own. When I, my faith and trust is in God, the Holy Spirit now lives within me and challenges me and encourages me, teaches me and leads me, convicts me. I don't have to live this world alone. I'm in awe and wonder of all that God's already given. Look at verse 19 through 21. Here we see the results of submitting to the Holy Spirit speaking to one another in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. When you yield to the Holy Spirit, not to the something else that takes you out of control, then there's that. There's melody. Verse 20, giving thanks always for all things to God, the Father, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, submitting to one another in the fear of God. That's the evidence that the Holy Spirit's working in your life. I always want something, okay, how do I know for sure that God's working in my life, that I'm yielding to the Holy Spirit? What he says is, verse 19, you're going to be joyful. You're singing and making melody. Verse 20, you're going to be thankful, giving thanks always. Number three, verse 21, you're going to submit. Wow, that's a curse word in our culture, isn't it? We don't want that. We don't want to hear that. I don't want to hear submit. I don't want to hear sacrifice. I don't want to do anything. That has nothing to do with what I want. But when we're following the Holy Spirit leading in our life, Holy Spirit doesn't provide us or prepare us for an argument. Okay, I'm getting ready to battle this person. I I think I can win it. God, would you just help me? Help me to win this one. Help my, my sports teams to win. Help me get a good grade so I can pass high school. I don't want to study, but just help me get that. Holy Spirit doesn't prepare you for a fight or an argument. But God, through the Holy Spirit, humbles you, makes you thankful, and gives you joy in your life. Even in times of trouble, 
and the craziness of this life. These three attributes, joy, thankfulness, and submission, are the exact opposite of entitlement. In our culture, I deserve. I have rights. Do you know who I am? Those three attributes are the exact opposite of entitlement. Being filled and controlled by the Holy Spirit affects the way that we live every day and our perspective and our attitude. When we mention those two words that I mentioned earlier, people get offended. Sacrifice, submit. And many, many people, if you're following a leader or if you're a leader and you mention those words, those are deal breakers. No, 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 no. That's not the way this is going to go. That's not what I want to do. But Jesus, who is God in the flesh, the incarnation, was the ultimate example of humility and submission and sacrifice that helps us see how to humble ourselves this way. 1 John 3.16 says, By this we know love, because he, speaking of Jesus Christ, laid down his life for us. You see, he didn't need to die. Dying didn't benefit him. He didn't need to have a sacrifice for him because he was perfect and sinless. He willingly laid down his life for my good. The cross was for my good. And for your good. For our well-being. But that verse doesn't end with just the portion that I read. I'll read it again. By this we know love because he laid down his life for us. That verse doesn't end there. That's only part of it. The second half says, And we also ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. What he's saying is, as a child of God, that same mentality should be in his children. That we live for others. In other words, we're, we're really the exact opposite of this culture. That chooses to live for itself, we're the exact opposite. And we choose to live for others. As followers of Christ and born in the family of God, serving others should be what we have in common. Now, growing up in my family for vacation, we would go to the Lake of the Ozarks. My dad loved fishing. I never really picked up on it. I didn't have the patience. I think if he would have, if I'd have known more about it, I probably would have. It's not that I dislike fishing, but normally I just went swimming. And we would find places to jump off, or a rope swing or something like that. We went to the Lake of the Ozarks. My dad would fish, and my dad uh, was a fantastic swimmer. So after he's done fishing, we'd all go and we'd find a cliff to jump off. And there were some that were 10, 15 feet, some 20. There was one that was about 85 foot. So what we did before we ever climbed up on this cliff, we dove down as far as we could to make sure that there were no rocks where we were jumping. And then you don't want to, you make sure that there's not mud that's really thick because if you jump off feet first and you go down in the mud, your feet get stuck and then they, it keeps you down there and you drown. So you make sure that all of those, you make sure all of that's safe. When you would climb up there, sometimes it was so steep getting up there that you couldn't climb down. You had to jump. Wow. That's pretty scary. Because it looks totally different from the top than it does from the water. And I remember we always would make fun of each other. Like, who's going to be the one that's going to be, that's going to jump off first? Because you're the most brave. When words like submission and sacrifice are brought up in this culture and there's an emphasis on serving others, sometimes we hesitate to go first. Oh, it's easy to talk about. I can preach about it all day long. But to actually live out and submit, you know what we tend to do? We wait for somebody else to display that. Are you going to do that? If you do that, I'll do that. Are you going to go first? Sometimes people hesitate to go first. But we don't have to wait for others to serve others. What's exciting for every believer is asking God to work in your heart to take the first step yourself. 
Would you, would you just stop and think, okay, what can I do for somebody else? I don't know if they know Jesus Christ as their Savior. So understanding it's not about me, I can serve them by telling them Jesus Christ. The difference that he made in my life. It may be serving others in, in one of the many ministries here on campus. But there are things that people volunteer that you can do here that you can do off campus as well. You see, we have people that have volunteered, some to greet you at the door, and that's during services. Some to care and, and give attention to shut-ins, that's during the week. Maybe you want to teach in a grow group or serve in the park, our children's ministry, during the services. Maybe you want to give and serve the food pantry during the week. Maybe you want to serve in the nursery during services or serve as counselors during the week. Maybe you want to listen to our children quote verses in Arwana in midweek. Or maybe you want to go and serve at camps this summer during the week. Maybe you want to serve as an online host. People that are online with this, there's somebody that sits there and says, hey, we're glad that you're here today. They engage them online. That's obviously during the service. Maybe you want to serve in construction and maintenance, just like has happened this week here on campus. Maybe you want to be on a prayer team. That's during the week. Maybe you want to be on the green team that we mentioned today that we'll meet after the service. You, want to, you love mowing grass. You love landscaping. You love all of that stuff. You want to do that during the week. Maybe you want to serve at, an adopted, at our adopted grade school, Wanda Gray, during the week. Maybe you can serve in the sound booth. Maybe you can serve somebody by just greeting them when they come in here. Serve others. What are our action points today? Let's go over them and then we'll be through. What should we do because of what you've heard today? Number one, honestly evaluate yourself. Honestly evaluate yourself. Don't tell yourself a lie. You know better than that. Honestly evaluate yourself. Has Christ worked, number one, in your heart to, by faith, trust in him? That's the first part of an evaluation. If not, the Holy Spirit is not present for you to rely on. If you haven't put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ, then you can't rely on the Holy Spirit. So in your evaluation, you would say, I don't have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. Well, if that's your evaluation, then let's settle that today. You would recognize first that you believe that Jesus is who he said he is. And that he's done what he said he's done. That you would admit that you're a sinner. That Christ died for your sins. And he died for my sins. Offering me freedom. By faith today. To settle that you say I want to put my faith and trust in him. In Jesus Christ. Because, he's what, because of what he's done for me. If so. In your time of prayer, as you bow your heads, I want you to say, God, I believe in you. I believe you sent your son for me to die on the cross for my sins. Would you be my Lord and Savior? Forgive me my sins and come into my heart and be my Lord. You see, you can settle that today. Just an honest, simple evaluation. If you have put your faith and trust in God today, then guess what? The Holy Spirit's now there to deal with you and to convict you and to lead you and to teach you. Don't be drunk with wine where is excess, but be filled with the Spirit. Rely on the Holy Spirit. If you've put your faith and trust in God today, then at the end of the service or when it's time to respond, I'm going to have, ask you to come down and talk to one of the individuals that are here. Let them know what you've done. So, In your honest evaluation, maybe you already know that you've put your faith and trust in Christ. So let me ask, encourage you as a, a, as a believer, would you consider yourself a giver or a taker in the body of Christ? Do you, do you give or do you consume? If you're a giver, that in your time of prayer, thank the Lord for working in your heart. Or if you would say, you're, you know, I'm mainly a consumer. I find here's what I want for me.
then let me, as a loving pastor today, let me prepare you to face a battle to submit, to rely on the Holy Spirit. This week, as you, as you open up God's Word and you read, then you want to rely on the Holy Spirit to, to, make, to cause you to respond out of love and out of a relationship with God. Respond to the principles that you read in His Word. Just get ready to face a battle. Because we fight against sacrifice and submission. There will be one day, Scripture says, every knee will bow. Every tongue will confess. You know what? He is Lord. There will be no problem submitting or humbling ourselves then. Why not now? So first, do an honest evaluation. Second, emphasize God's blessings in your life. Would you today, if you think about it, write down some things that that you love about your church. Point out the positives. Instead of complaining about something online, why don't you say, hey, listen, now here's how God's blessed. I get to be a part of this church family. Because we're born sinners, we lean towards the negatives. And I'll be the first one to tell you, Parkcrest is not perfect. But we strive to follow the Lord. And we are family. And you are blessed where you can live out your faith and serve. Here at church, at home, at work, and even in your neighborhood. Third, first is an evaluation. Second, emphasize. Third, engage and serve engage and serve. After praying for God's leadership and wisdom, get involved. If you get in your car and you're ready to leave here and you never put it in drive, it never engages in gear, you're going to sit there for a long time. And I think there are some believers that are more than willing just not to be engaged and are sitting in one place. Would you engage And say, I want to serve others. And after praying, he said, I want to be the hands and feet of Jesus Christ here in Springfield. I want to serve. I want to serve. With your heads bowed and eyes closed today, would you allow me to pray with you? Would you please stand this morning? We're going to sing a a song of invitation. You have an opportunity to respond. And in the th- three things that we've talked about today, I have no idea where you are. Before I preach this message, I had to evaluate my life. Look at what I'm doing. The Lord's already dealt with me. Let me pray with you today. Because if, you, if you've accepted Jesus Christ, we want to know. Maybe you want somebody to pray with you today about it, facing that battle this week. Maybe you're just looking for a place to be involved and say, I'm ready to serve others. You have an opportunity to respond. Before that, let me pray with you. Lord, thank you so much. Thank you for your word. Thank you for the way that you've shown your love to us by sending your son to die on the cross that you put us first. Lord, I pray for your your children today, for, for me, that I would serve others like you have put others first ahead of you. That you humbled yourself and was obedient to the cross. Lord, I pray that we would model that in our life. Lord, I pray for those today that have have sat there after an evaluation, realize that they don't have a relationship with you, but they want to start one. They want to put their trust in you. They want to live for you and live for others. Lord, would you help them to respond? And Lord, as we talk about getting engaged, maybe you're leading people to join. Maybe you're leading people to an area of service and convicted hearts today. And Lord, would you encourage them to respond as well? Not just think about it, but leave here and live it out. We'll be very careful to give you all the honor and all the praise because of what you do. And we ask this in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Thank you again for joining us on our online service today. 
We just wanted to take the next few moments to describe the hope that we have in Christ and how you can share in this hope too. First, we recognize God's design. Genesis 1.27 tells us, So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. Adam and Eve, the first people God created, were in fellowship with God. One day, however, they were tempted to pursue their own desires instead of obeying God, and they sinned. Through Adam, sin spread to all of mankind. The fact is, we all have a sin nature and have sinned. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. None of us could match up or earn salvation. And the punishment of our sin is death and separation from God. However, God isn't willing that any should perish, but that all would repent and experience eternal life. God knew that we needed a sinless Savior to die as a sacrifice for us. The Bible points us to who that Savior is, and His name is Jesus. Jesus came and lived the perfect, sinless life, and willingly died on a cross and bore the wrath of God that we deserved. Romans 5.8 states, But God demonstrates His own love towards us, in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Jesus rose from the dead, proving His worthiness as a sacrifice, and provides us now with the chance to accept Him as Lord and experience eternal life. So how can you experience the hope of going from eternal punishment and separation from God to eternal life and relationship with God? Repent and believe. You must recognize that you are a sinner in need of salvation and you must believe in Jesus. Romans 10, 9 through 10 tells us that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart, one believes unto righteousness and with the mouth, confession is made unto salvation. Admit your need for a Savior, and by God's grace, accept Jesus by faith. If you'd like to know more about salvation, check out our website at parkcrestbaptist.org forward slash salvation. We'd love to have a conversation with you about Jesus and why we're all about showing His love so that people can know Him and grow in their relationship with Him. Thank you again for joining us today.